chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. And the King James text today reads, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do ye think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy, but he giveth more grace. Wherefore, he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Why prayers go unanswered? If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment. Master, today, God, we thank you for the encouraging, uplifting, faith-building spirit we feel in the house of God today as we've been encouraged in song to walk hand in hand with Jesus. Lord, the Word of God must go forth. The most important part of any service it's not the singing of songs. It's not the taking of offerings. It is not today God testimonies. It is the preaching of the word. For it is by reason of the preached word that our faith is built up. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Master, in the name of Jesus, we loosen the house of God today. The mighty anointing of the Holy Ghost. Speak to our hearts by reason of your word. Speak to our spirit today, O oh God. O oh Lord, let the word of God go far beyond the confines of our mind and let it find its mark in the deepest part of our being. Lord, that we might be changed by it. That the word of God might go forth and it might save them that are lost. It might bring healing to those who are sick. It might today, God, bring deliverance to those who are bound. Master, in the name of Jesus, we pray, God, that you would do a mighty work by reason of your word. Use this imperfect vehicle, this imperfect vessel today to do a perfect work. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' glorious name. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated today. Why prayers go unanswered? I'm going to tell you folks, I don't have to do a whole lot of interpretation of this passage to answer that question. The, the, the brother of the Lord states quite clearly and plainly, if I can turn this off, I'll It'll help me not to accidentally change. Well, it ain't going to happen. There we go. I'll just do it like that then. All right. The brother of the Lord answers the question abundantly clear when he says, Ye ask and receive not. Why? He said, Because. Well, because means he's, I'm about to tell you why, right? He said, Because. Ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. I'm going to tell you, we, we you know, I, I know I'm, I'm probably sounding a lot more old-fashioned Pentecostal these days. I'm getting down to the nitty-gritty, but be it, so be it. 
I am so tired of people calling themselves believers and calling themselves Christians and doing everything every way except God's way. I'm tired of it. I'm, I'm tired of it. I have never seen anything like the condition of the church today. Lisa, for over 30 years, I've been warning the church prophetically of the massive, massive false doctrine that is encapsulated in the prosperity gospel message. That is a false gospel. It is a false message, folks. You better get it in your head now. Trump is in the White House because so many stupid, foolish Christians have bought into the prosperity gospel and they have equated the possession of wealth with the blessing of God. Yes. Amen. Amen. I'm going to tell you, some of the most blessed people I know are some of the poorest people on this planet. Amen. But to talk to them, they don't know any better. They believe they're rich. They believe they own it all. They believe they've got it all. Because they walk hand in hand with Jesus. Amen. My Lord have mercy. There was a time when if you walked in relationship with the Lord, that was thought to be your greatest possession. We've got people today who believe that God is Johnny a genie in a bottle. You just rub your Bible a few times and the Lord is going to appear in front of you and you just tell Him whatever you want and He'll give it to you. I remember as a young preacher, I remember preachers beginning to get on television and preach that when you pray, the reason your prayer doesn't get answered is because you're not specific enough. Because after all, God is an idiot and He doesn't know what you need. You don't tell God, Lord, I need a car. No, you tell God what kind of car you want. You tell them what year. You tell them what make. You tell them what model. You tell them how many miles you want on it and blah, blah, blah. And bless God, that's how you ought to pray. That is the most foul, false message that anybody could ever preach. You know what my Bible tells me? My Bible tells me, number one, my God shall supply every need, your every need, according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. My Bible also tells me that my God knows what we have need of before we even ask Him. You don't tell God what kind of make and model car you want. <coughs> Try that with your mother and dad and see how far that goes. Now there are some people in the world maybe got parents so rich and they're so spoiled, Martin, that they can tell mom and dad, I want thus and so, and mom and dad will rush out and get it for them. But the average parent, you ain't going to tell them when you're 16 getting your first car, you're not going to tell them what kind of car you're going to get. They're going to tell you. And it don't matter if you love Fords, if all dad and mom can afford is an old Oldsmobile, bless God, you're getting an Oldsmobile. And you're going to like it. Hello now. I guess maybe I'm the only one in the room. Well, I want to tell you today, my God knows what I, listen to me now, my God knows what I have need of. My God knows what I have need of. My God knows what I have need of. The promise of God is He will meet every need. He will meet every need. He will meet every need. He never said for a moment, I'll give you everything you want. He said, I'll meet every need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. God knows what you need. If you need a car, say you need a car. And if God gives you an old 72 Chevrolet, be glad for it. Amen. Amen. My Lord, have mercy. I'm going to tell you, you people got to learn that uh, the rewards of God 
come with time. Mm -hmm. You know, just like mom and dad, sometimes you've got to prove yourself before they can trust you with bigger and better things. Hello now. Most kids, when they get their first car, thought, Dad and Mom go out and buy some old clunker somewhere. Because they know that Johnny or Bill or Frank or Fred or Sue, they're new drivers. New drivers haven't been on the road very long. They don't have a whole lot of experience behind the wheel. They're bound to bang it up. They're bound, aren't they? They're bound to have a wreck in their first year. Last thing in the world I want to do is give them a brand new car, put it on my insurance, and have them rack it up. Because my insurance is going to double in the first year my kids got a car. All because I was fool enough to give them something that they weren't quite ready for. I'm going to tell you something, folks. Just because you think you're ready for a Rolls Royce, just because you think you're ready for a Bentley, just because you think you're ready for a Mercedes Benz or a Cadillac or a Lincoln, that does not mean that God sees you as being ready for those things. Furthermore, you may very well not be deserving of them either. <laughs> you may not deserve it. Oh, brother, you're not supposed to tell people that. Why not? It's the truth. I remember when I was a kid, my mother trusted me to do a lot of things that she'd have never trusted my brother Michael to do, not for a million dollars. No way. And she told him so. She told me so. Said, there ain't no way in the world I'd ever trust Michael to do thus and so. Or, you know, I couldn't count on him to be in on time. Or I couldn't count on him to go to the store and come right back home without making some kind of detour and probably wind up in a road race with somebody down some long highway somewhere. You know what I'm talking about? Mom knew she could count on me. She knew I was trustworthy. I had proven myself. Do you understand what I'm telling you, Dave? I don't think too many people want to tell God what they want because they're not interested in proving themselves and showing the Lord they can handle it. They just want to tell God, Martin, what they want. Bless God. I want a Rolls Royce, Lord. I think I'm ready for a Rolls Royce. I think I'm deserving of a Rolls Royce. We got a bunch of two-year-old babies in the church who think they're supposed to get everything they wham wham for. And they don't understand that every prayer they pray, God is looking at what motivates them to pray that prayer. I remember when I was a kid and I first started driving. I don't know why I'm using this analogy so much today, but it is what it is. My mother could tell you. I'd look at cars, and one of the things that I looked at, I liked, I liked big cars. I didn't like little cars. I wasn't one of them that liked the Camaro and the Firebird and the Mustang and all that. Those were too little for me. I liked a big old car. And back when I was a kid, cars were cars. You didn't have an old, you didn't have a hood out in front of you. You had an ocean out in front of you. You remember what I'm talking about? And you had to have an ocean out in front of you, because honey, that hood was covering one enormous engine. You remember that? My first car was a Ford Gran Torino Elite Coupe with a Opera windows, you know, the Landau half roof, you know, it was cream colored with a gold roof with white leather interior. My God, it was luxury. It was beautiful. The car drove incredible. It had a front end so long on it. If you needed to make a turn, you had to start turning three blocks early. Because, <laughs> I mean, that front end was so far ahead of you. I mean... What a joy it was to drive that old car. But you know, when I would be shopping for a car as a kid, I literally was thinking in terms of how easy will it be for me to carry people to church? Most kids today, that thought never goes through their head. 
No, when they're shopping for a car, I don't care how devout a Christian they call themselves. No, when they're shopping for a car, they want that little tiny sports car. They want that little tiny BMW, you know, that you can bear. For me, I need two of them, one to strap to each foot. <laughs> But they want that little tiny, you know, convertible. They want that because they're going to look so cool. And they're going to be able to pick up the girls. Or they're going to be able to pick up the fellas. Oh, everybody's going to think they're a hot shot in their car. And here I was, big donkey that I am, saying, Lord, I want a car that I can use to glorify you. I want a car that I can use to build the kingdom of heaven. I want a car that I can use to lead some soul to the cross of Calvary for the salvation of their soul. That's how my mind worked. I had $20 in my pocket and somebody was hungry and somebody needed it. I don't care what I had in my head, I wanted to spend that $20 on it. The minute I saw a need, that became my priority. I got news for you. I think most of us in this room can say that I still live that way. We got people today, bless God, if they're saving up money for get them a new suit, or they're saving up money, buy them a new ring, or they're saving up money to put down on a car. And bless God, the man of God, the woman of God, the church of God has a great need and, and they, you know, the church is struggling and suffering. Honey, they ain't about to dip into that. They don't see your, they don't see the need of the kingdom as being any greater than their own need. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? I remember one day we had a lady and her partner in this church and this girl come to me and oh, she was going through a hard time, and she said, is there any chance I could borrow just enough money for some gas, and, and I'll pay you back on Friday or whatever, payday. And, and I told her, I said, honey, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't have it. At that time, things were so tight for me, I, I, I didn't have room to cough, all right? And I told her, I said, honestly, I don't have it. I, I wish I did, but I don't. I said, but I'll tell you what, if I, if I do lend this to you, I, I have to be honest with you, I'm going to have to have it back on payday because I'm going to rob Peter to pay Paul, you know, so I can go ahead and help you. So I made the exception and I went ahead uh, and lent her this money. Payday come, guess what? They don't come to church. Next Sunday comes, they don't come to church. Next Sunday comes, they don't come to church. I forget exactly how it came about. I sent her an email or something and said, you know, we've been missing you and wondering what happened and, you know. And long story short, we got into a little discussion about this money and she let me know that her needs were more important than my needs. Well, of course my needs are more important than your needs. That's what she told me. Because I told her, I said, I'm hurt. I'm genuinely hurt that you seem to think your needs are more imperative than my needs. I, I literally put myself out. I could have just said to you, I don't have it, and called it a day. And that's what I should have done, folks. To be honest, that's because I honestly didn't have it. I honestly didn't. But I was trying so hard to be a help to her. And I said, you know, it bothers me that you would think that your situation and your needs supersede the importance of mine. And she literally come back with, well, of course my needs are more important than yours. And I thought, boy, I'll tell you what. See, now I don't do people that way. Tommy can tell you, he's known me a lot of years. If I owe you, I owe you. And I'll say, you know what, I don't know what need they have. I don't know, you know, I don't care if it's going to break me and I'm, I'm going to be right flat back to bust it. 
The fact is, I don't know what kind of situation I'd leave you in if I don't pay you. You know what I'm saying? So I think about the other person. The way I grew up, uh, uh, Bill, that's the way a Christian thinks. But see, we live in a world today where the kingdom of God, the people of God, the work of God, the ministers of the gospel are at our lowest level of importance. We've got all kinds of other things that are far more important. And then when we want something, we seem to think God is just there to hand us what we want. But the Bible teaches that if we're faithful over little, God will make us ruler over much. But in order to get the much, you've got to prove you can be faithful with little. This is what people don't understand. This is the principle they don't get. Oh, they want the much. They're praying for the much. Oh, they pray for years and years and years for the much, and the much never comes in. And then they sit there and say, why don't my prayers get answered? I've been praying for all these years for that Rolls Royce. Why don't my prayers get answered? James told you why. Because when you do ask, you ask amiss. You ask for things that you ought not to be asking for. You know what? If you'd asked God for a car 20 years ago, you'd have had a car. You know why I know? You know how I know? Because the promise of His Word is, My God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. He said He'll supply your needs. But if all you're going to God with are a bunch of wants, guess what? Your prayers are going to go unanswered. And as you're asking for your wants, you're failing to ask for your needs. Hello now. What you ought to be asking for is, Lord... I need a car if you'll give me a car. You know, Elisa, in my early ministry, I don't know how many times I drove around in some old ratty car that somebody donated to me. I literally had, oh heavens, at least two or three different cars over the years donated to me. Every one of them, without fail, was something I wouldn't buy if, if I'd have had the money. I'd have never gone out and bought it. Uh, one time, the, these folk in the church come to me, bless their heart. And they said, brother, we love you and you're so faithful and we know you need a car and we've got, I forget how much, like $500. Of course, this is a number of years back when, believe it or not, you could buy an old used car for $500. And they said, we've got $500 that we, we want to help you get a car with. And that brother uh, went with me and we looked at some cars we found in the paper, you know, Finally, I wound up with some old Chevrolet. Now, anybody that knows me knows. If that was my money I was spending, I wouldn't spend a nickel on a Chevrolet. I'm sorry for those of you who drive Chevrolet. You're looking at a Ford man here, okay? My family, we're Ford people. I mean, you know, we're, we believe Ford is manufactured in heaven, all right? So anybody knows me knows I, I ain't about to go out and buy no Chevrolet. No way in the world. But you know what? I got a Chevrolet and I love my Chevrolet and I drove my Chevrolet. My Chevrolet served me. It served its purpose. I was able to go out and preach the gospel. I was able to go out and earn a living. I was able to do what I needed to do with that old Chevrolet and I was happy for it. I was ministering in Pennsylvania for about a year. I desperately needed a car. And somebody came to me and said, Brother, there's an old uh, junkyard over here. And this fellow's got some cars there that he sells dirt cheap. And the reason he does is somebody brought them in and junked them, but they run. They're, they're not like they don't run. They may burn a little oil. They may, you know, have little issues. And if you want to spend the money to fix them, you can. If you don't, you just got to put oil in it every 20 miles, you know. And they said, and if you'll go there, you can buy a car for $200. And here's $200. He said, I wish I could help you more. I said, that's all right. All I know is I need a car. Mm -hmm. I went to that little dealer, and boy... Uh, he had him a white four-door Oldsmobile. 
Anybody who knows me knows. I ain't interested in Oldsmobile. <laughs> I bought that little Oldsmobile, I think it was the Cutlass, you know, sedan. Cute little car, it really was a cute little car. It burned oil, I had to put oil in it, you know, every trip I made I had to put a quart of oil in it or whatever, but it ran. You know what? God uses life circumstances sometimes to teach us a lesson or two. Sometimes we're too proud and the Lord needs to humble us. Hello now. Amen. Sometimes the Lord needs to humble us. He, he needs to knock us down a pig. See, the Bible said God cannot elevate us until first we've learned to humble ourselves. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and He will lift you up. Well, the problem is we got people too proud to drive an old Oldsmobile. We got people too proud to drive an old Chevrolet. Well, guess what, honey? If you can't drive an Oldsmobile, if you can't drive an old Chevrolet, you might as well just forget all about your dream of ever driving a Rolls. That's right. That is right. You see, you got to humble yourself in this sight of the Lord before God can elevate you. I get so sick and tired. If I hear one more idiot preacher on the internet or on, on uh, YouTube titling a message about how God's going to elevate you. God's going to elevate you. God's going to elevate you. And all they love to preach this because there's a bunch of Christians out there who just love these words. The Bible said in the last days they would Heap unto themselves teachers having itching ears. Oh, they don't want to hear what Pastor Charles is saying today. No, no, no. They'd rather have T.D. Jakes tell them that they're on the elevator to great success and God's about to hit the penthouse button for you. Glory to God. Well, that'd be wonderful if everybody in your church were in the same exact place spiritually. But you know what? I've pastored a lot of churches in my life, and I've yet to pastor one, Johnny, where everybody was at the same exact place spiritually. So I can't get up in the pulpit and preach God's going to elevate everybody in the church when the fact of the business is some of them people are so far from being in a place to be elevated, it's not even funny. But well, we live in an age where people gravitate to the message that tickles their ears. They gravitate to the message that sounds good in their hearing. Not that sounds biblical, not that sounds sound. You know, when I first started my first church, I was so old-fashioned Pentecostal back then. Dear God, have mercy. Long hair, long dresses, you name it, I preached it. I mean, some people thought I was what they call a hard preacher, you know. Oh, I was a hard preacher. And my church grew by leaps and bounds. I preach what I preach today. We can't hardly get people. Here I go again. Going to break another one. <laughs> can't hardly get people to come in the door. Why? Don't tell me what I need to hear. Tell me what I want to hear. Don't tell me the truth. Tell me what tickles my ear. Tell me what suits my fancy. Don't tell me my prayer isn't answered because maybe I'm not ready for what I'm praying for. Don't tell me my prayer isn't answered because I am praying in the flesh rather than in the spirit. Don't tell me I, that my prayer isn't answered because I'm praying for things I want rather than things I need. Don't tell me that, Pastor. Tell me my prayer is an answer because the devil is hindering it. Glory to God. Oh, but if I'll just give Brother Jake's $50, he'll punch that old devil right in the nose for me and my elevation will come. I will tell you the biggest demon in the church today is the spirit of pride. The Bible said, let not a man think more highly of himself than he ought. The Bible teaches us, brother, that we ought to prefer one another above our own selves. I've had people in this church, you know some of these people. If I was to name their name, you know who I was talking about. 
They never said it in so many words, but I've been in this thing a long time, Lisa. I tell you, when I tell you I see things and know things and understand things, a lot of y'all don't see and don't understand and don't know. Trust me, I know what I'm talking about. You can't be doing what I've been doing for 35 years without knowing a little bit of something. And I've had people sit in this church, never say it with their own mouth, but the whole time they sat there, they believed in their heart that they could do my job better than me. Well, they never said it. They never said it in so many words, but that was in their spirit. They were so puffed up and full of themselves that they honestly believed everything the pastor said was wrong, everything the pastor preached was wrong, but every decision the pastor made was wrong, because after all, I'll tell you what, if I was the pastor, here's what I would do, and, and I hate to confess this, but I'm going to anyway. You know how I know? Because that was me once. You know, there's an old saying, you can't kid a kidder. I'm serious. That was me once. I had so much pride in me. Oh, man, I love to sit and second guess my pastor. And my grandmother was that way. She'd sit there and judge the pastor and, you know, sit in judgment of the pastor, second guess him all day. Well, I inherited that devil, and I used to do that to pastors that I had. So when I got somebody sitting on a church seat doing it to me, I got news for you, sweetie. It, I know exactly what's going on because I've been there. I've been sitting in that seat. I know what that demon smells like. And when I smell it, I smell it. Do you know what I'm talking about? Pride will destroy you. More people wind up backslidden and away from God because prayers don't get answered and they begin to question whether or not God's real. They begin to question whether or not this Bible is true. And yet they don't understand that their prayers have gone unanswered, not because God ain't real, but because they're not being real. Hello now. you got to get real with God, baby. You've got to learn to understand that Jesus said in the Garden of Gethsemane, Thy will be done. Hello now. He said, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father, which art in heaven... You know what that means? That means God ain't sitting where you're sitting. That means God sees things from a better perspective than you can. Our Father which art in heaven. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm here to tell you. I'm glad God can see better what I need. I'm glad God can see better what I can handle. When I was a kid, mom and dad a lot of times could better see what I could handle. Are you, am I telling the truth? Grandma and grandpa knew. Oh, Lisa wants this, but she can't handle this. I want to stay up and watch The Exorcist. I want to watch it. Everybody in school has watched it. Honey, you can't handle it. Oh, yes, I did. I promise I'll be able to handle it. I just won't be able to go to school now. Everybody I saw it just like they did. Okay. She sees the movie, and for the next six weeks, she lies in bed every night. <laughs> I tell them the truth. You thought you could handle it, but you really couldn't. We've got to understand, folks, it is not our job to tell God anything. It is our job to seek out God's voice so He can tell us. It is not our job to convey our will to Him. It is our job to seek His will for us. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? It is not our job to question how God meets our need. The Apostle Paul said, I have learned to be content whatsoever state I am in. He said, whether I'm lacking, I'm happy. When things are going well, I'm happy. Doctor tried to give me some news this week that wasn't all that hopeful and positive. And you know what? It don't change my mind about worshiping God today. I didn't come to church today with anything in my mind that, Lord, you're not deserving of my worship today because look at what I might have to be going through. Look at what I might have. Oh, baloney. Hallelujah. 
Whatever path God has for me, I'm going to receive it joyfully. Or I'm going to try real hard. I'm going to accept His plan. I'm going to accept His will. You know what? Sometimes I'm convinced that God makes me go through hell so some of y'all can see it. I'm serious. I believe with all my heart when I went through that experience with my ear going deaf and all that, I believe God did that for people in the church at the time so they could see God perform a miracle. So they could see how God answers prayer. So they could see how the Lord kept His word. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? Sometimes, if I'm the only one in the room got enough faith to believe God for the pretty nasty trials. Guess who's the one going to get hit with the nasty trials? God ain't going to put that on you if you're too weak to handle it. The Word of God said He will not put more on us than we are able to bear. Am I telling the truth? So Martin, if God's trying to make a big point, He ain't going to make a big point with you because you may or may not have the faith to survive that test. So He puts it on somebody else in the church that has the faith to survive the test. Thanks, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I told you before, I said it in Bible study just this last week or so. The Word of God said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. If God has to put my body through hell so that he can make a point to the church, so that he can do something to demonstrate something to the church, if God has to put me physically through something so that he can uh, demonstrate something to his people, then I have got to be willing to present my body a living sacrifice. Now, I've told you, I don't have a lot of fight in me these days. I don't. I'm tired. I've, I've, I've never been through anything in my life like I've been through the last 25 years. It has been the hardest 25 years of my life. Lisa, if I'd had my way, I'd have quit 23 and a half years ago. I'm not a fighter by nature, to be honest. I'm not. By nature, I quit the minute I see I can't win, I quit. That's why I give it everything I've got, Bill, from word go. That's why I throw myself into every stinking thing I do, because I have every intention of winning. And when I throw myself into something for 25 years and it doesn't look like I'm any further today than I was 25 years ago, Lisa, I don't have much motivation to keep doing it. I've told people that I've been in relationships with over the years, I said, I'm going to tell you when you need to worry about me. I'm a talker. As long as my mouth's moving, everything's good. I said, you need to start worrying the minute I go quiet. Because mm -hmm. the minute I go quiet, Johnny, you know what that means? It means I give up. I quit. Can't do it anymore. I'm tired of it. As long as I'm talking, I'm trying. But the minute I stop talking, I've quit. I, I'm, not gonna, I'm, I'm just not going to do it anymore. I'm over it. I'll never forget somebody I was in a relationship one time. I said, I'm going to tell you something. If I get to the point where I'm over it and I just, and I mean, and I come to the point where I just say, okay, I'm through, I can't do it, not one more second, there ain't no way in the world you're going to change my mind. And you know what? That fool thought they were going to change my mind. Guess what, Lisa? <laughs> couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. You couldn't change my mind for all the money in the world because once I get to that point, I'm over it. I'm going to tell you something. All the years that I've been preaching this good, glorious, positive message of the gospel to the LGBT community, and I don't understand why people aren't running through this door by the hundreds. I really don't. I don't understand why people aren't flowing into this building Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. I will never understand why it is not so. Not because Pastor Charles is the best preacher in the world. I may stutter, I may pass gas, I may burp, I may belch, I might do all kind of, I might be the worst preacher in the world, but the worst preacher in the world is at least preaching a good message. 
I've heard some pretty lousy preachers in my day. Whew, have I heard one of them baptized me in Jesus' name. I'm telling you, that man, I, I swear to heavens, he could put the Lord to sleep. He was horrible, horrible to listen to. And I knew another Pentecostal preacher up in Connecticut where I grew up. Oh, my Lord, he had a reputation for being the most boring preacher on the planet. Had a reputation for being the most boring preacher on the planet. But you know what? Every Sunday his church was full. Every Sunday his church was full. You know why? Because even though the way he said it would bore the fire out of you, at least what he was saying was the truth. And people loved the truth. Oh, my Lord have mercy. The Bible said in the last days they'd be lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. The Bible said in the last days they would suppose that gain is godliness. From such turn away. We have got a church world today that has come to believe that if you're a television preacher, that somehow, someway, God has elevated you and made you something special. And that's why you're on television, Johnny, because God had to have made you something special for you to be on TV. No, but I'll tell you what, the devil sure has done a work with some of these people. The enemies made sure some of these preachers got plenty of air time. The enemies made sure a lot of these preachers get all the money in the world they need. I can't even get enough money to pay this church's bills. And Benny Hinn's got enough money to live in a mansion and to own airplanes and to drive around in Rolls Royces. I'm not asking for that. I'm asking for money to do the work of God. We can't even get that. Why prayers go unanswered. 1 John 5, 14 and 15. And this is the confidence that we have in Him. That if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. You know what that tells me? That tells me before I start asking... For what I need, I ought to first start asking what God wants me to have. Yeah. Hello now. That tells me that when I begin my prayer, the first thing I ought to pray for is, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy will be done in my life as it is accomplished in heaven. The angels do what you want them to do because they've been built to do what you want them to do. That's how they were designed. Lord, I want you to recreate in me a humble heart. I want you to recreate in me an obedient heart that will do what you want me to do, when you want me to do it, how you want me to do it, however you want me to do it. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of Him. It's not about telling God what you want. It's about letting the Lord know what your needs are. And then let God fill your needs any old way He wants to. When Tommy and I found ourselves in a real pickle about three and a half years ago with our house, our little house we had bought over on the, in Mesquite was falling in around our ears, and we had decided... We were going to uh, buy a new house, or at least try to buy a new house. And uh, all of a sudden, circumstances came about that made it imperative that we buy something, literally get financing, buy it, and close on it, and move within about 30 days. Now, how often do you, have you ever seen anybody be able to find a house, number one, get it financed, close on it, and get moved within 30 days. You don't see that often. If you know anything about buying houses, you know that don't happen. It happened for us. We looked at houses. When we saw that house we're in, I said, now oh, they're asking more than, than I'm willing to pay. And I said, no, let's keep looking, didn't we? We kept looking. 
I didn't stop and say, Lord, I love these hands. It's so beautiful. Oh, Jesus. Oh, 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 Lord, let me go talk to Prophet Mosley and let him tell me that God's going to give me the house I want. <laughs> I needed a house. I did not need that house. I still don't need that house. But you see, there were many times I needed a house and I was happy with far less. All of a sudden, this time come around and the Lord put something in our lap and it took me forever to wake up and realize that God had put it in our lap. I wasn't making any assumptions. I wasn't assuming that I'd been faithful and the Lord was willing to bless me for my faithfulness. I wasn't assuming nothing. I said, no, kept looking. We'd come back to this house, look at it again, all because that stinking realtor insisted we do it. She, I, she kept trying to tempt us. Finally, I said, all right, well, I'm going to make an offer. I'm warning you right now, it's going to be $15,000 less than they're asking. I'm telling you right now, if they don't accept my offer, $15,000 less than I'm asking, you can keep it. I don't want to hear a counter offer. No one know nothing about it. Well, do you want them to pay the clothes? Of course I want them to pay the closing costs. You want them to fix stuff that's broken? Of course I want them to fix stuff that's broken. I'm putting all the costs on them plus asking them to come down 15000 on the price. Don't you know that when the inspector came in, the electric box was in the closet and the inspector said, oh, no, 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 no. The building code today is that the the, the uh, electric box has to be on the back of the house, outside. Said, this electric box you've got has had a track record of starting fire. I said, oh, Lord. Said, you need to get a new electric box. Now, because your house is the age it is, you can still put it on the inside. Your grandfather did. You can still put it on the inside, but you need a new electric box. So guess what, Lisa? That was one of the terms of the sale. We needed a new electric box. I told Tommy before our offer came back, before the, you know their offer came back, I said to him, I said, now we're willing to pay half the closing costs, but I haven't told them that. The closing costs are about 5000 see. And I said, now we, we've got the money to pay half the closing costs. So we'll see. If they come back and say, yeah, I'll give you the 15000 off, but you're going to have to pay half the closing costs, well, that we can still work with, okay? <laughs> what do they come back with? Well, we can't quite come down to your price. We, we can only come down 13000 not 15000 But we'll still pay all the closing costs. We'll still pay for all the repairs. We'll still put in the new electric box, yada, yada, yada. Guess what, folks? Those people not only put in the new electric box, but they had the electrician put it on the outside to meet the current building code. The, 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 uh, the man who did the inspection told me, he said, you're looking to put that box on the outside of the house. He said, you're looking about $2,500. They didn't even have to put it out there. The law allowed them to put a new box on the inside, but they put it on the outside to meet the current building code. I looked at Tommy, I said, we had the money. We were willing to pay 2500 toward the closing cost. Since they've come down 13000 but they're willing to pay all the closing costs, all we have to do is take 2000 out of the 2500 that we were willing to pay toward the closing cost and put it on our down payment, and we'll still be financing the same amount we were going to finance to begin with, and we're still $500 ahead. But I never started, when we prayed about that house, I said, Lord, if you want us to have it, open the doors. If you want us to have it. And I'm going to tell you something. He dropped that bugger in our lap. He literally <laughs> did it. He dropped that thing in our lap. And I mean, and then we stood there. I, Tommy, you know, you can't get him into tears for nothing. Me, on the other hand, I cry at the drop of a hat, and I'll drop a hat just to cry. 
But I'm going to tell you, I literally stood there and wept, and I said, Lord, I can't believe this. I, I cannot believe you would give us such a house. I, to me, it's a mansion. That's to me. I said, Lord, I can't believe this. But I didn't need that house. But the Bible said if we put God first in our life, he will even give us the desires of our heart. The problem we have in the church today is everybody wants to put the cart in front of the horse. They want their desires. They want their wants met. And then, Lord, if you'll do all this, I'll put you first. No, it don't work that way. Colossians 4 and 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you. Always laboring fervently for you in prayers. Listen. That ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. So you know what Epaphras prayed for the people of Colossus? You know what he prayed for the Colossian church? He prayed for them, Lisa, that they would always walk in the perfect will of God. My goodness, have mercy. How many of us don't even pray that for our own selves? How many of us don't even have that thought go through our own minds? But that's where our thinking should be. Lord, I want to be in your will. And if your will means I drive an old uh, uh, VW, then so be it. Romans 12 and 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, you're not supposed to think like the world thinks. You're not supposed to see things the way the world sees things. The world is caught up in consumerism. The world is caught up in a desire to be rich and to have and to possess. But the church is not so inclined to think. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. For what purpose? That ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Not list of wants. Will of God. The renewing of our mind. God has renewed our mind. Why? So that we can prove what is the good and the perfect will will of God. Oh my goodness. That should be our number one priority in our lives, to seek the will of God. In Matthew 6, 33, we quote it all the time, we hear it all the time in the church, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Put God first. I, I don't know how much simpler I could put it. Folks, I've been living this thing a long time. And God is my witness. I believe the Lord. I, I See, I'm not afraid to face God in the judgment. If I die tomorrow, so be it. I'm not afraid to face God in the judgment. Because I'm going to tell you something. If I had not proved nothing in the last 25 years, I proved that I am not moved by money. I proved that whatever God wants me to do, that's what I'm going to do, whether I like doing it or not. I know when I face the Lord, I won't be able to look at Him and say, Lord, I gave everything I had to what you asked me to do. Even when doing it was hard. Even when doing it bothered me. Even when doing it hurt. Even when doing it was so discouraging, I could barely get out of bed in the morning. I still got up and did it. Not afraid to face the Lord. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these other things shall be added unto you. All these things shall be added unto you. Lisa, I'm not afraid to face God. I know that for decades I've put His will above my own. I know for decades that I've done everything in my power to live His will, not mine. I hate to quote Donald Trump, but believe me. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> you have no idea how true that statement is that I just made. Lastly, today the Word of God declares, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. 
If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God. Do you see a theme here, folks? Abideth forever. So, the answer to that question today, why prayers go unanswered, is very simple. It wasn't in the will of God. You couldn't have prayed a prayer that would have gotten answered if first you'd have sought the will of God. Instead of telling God what your will is. Because I got news for you, children. Daddy don't care what your will is. He didn't go to the cross so you could dictate to him what you drive and what you won't drive, where you live and where you won't live, what you'll wear and what you won't wear. Come on now, who you'll date and who you won't date. My Lord, have mercy. Am I telling the truth today? No. God's will is the most important. I'm telling you, I've been preaching this message, Elisa, for... Uh, it. This theme has been an important theme in all the years that I've been doing affirming ministry. And I honestly believe it's because this is one area where not just affirming churches are missing the mark, but I think where the whole church universal is missing the mark. We've gotten so caught up, man, in telling God what our mind is and how we want it done and how, you know, that we've completely lost sight of how important it is to just put the kingdom of God first. I'm going to close with this thought today. I believe that I'm now, if God is merciful and I see the 19th of September, I'll be 53 years old. When I pastored my first churches years ago in the mainstream, birthdays came, oh, the people give me a nice love offering, they give me gifts, they go, oh, I got cards, I got all this. Christmas came, same thing. Pastor Appreciation Day, boy, I mean... They lined up to say nice things. And I've had to tell Tommy, if you notice, I, I don't even do pastor appreciation anymore. I went through so many years where people just didn't care. Nobody would show up. That would be the one Sunday. Yeah. Remember mm -hmm. old Tammy and Rose, oh, what yeah. happened, from, you know? Oh, yeah. People wonder why, uh, you know, why would the preacher get upset? I have no right to get upset. Well... Tell you what, when, when you give your everything to somebody year after year after year and you ask that one Sunday, please be here, please be here. It's our anniversary, please be here. And what's the one Sunday they decide to call out? Right? But who am I? Well, how dare I? How dare I expect anything of anybody in the church? How dare I? I haven't had a love offering given, and, and don't, please, this is not a guilt trip. I'm trying to illustrate something to you. I haven't had a love offering for a birthday, for Christmas, for anything else. I've been in Dallas since it'll be 17 years this coming Easter Sunday. It doesn't happen. I've been in affirming ministry 25 years. Never happened in any other church as they need it. This is the most thankless work I've ever done in my life. It absolutely is, to be honest. It is the most thankless. Not only is it thankless, you know, thankless is one thing. When you can look and see with your own eyes, you know, great results, then you don't care if anybody acknowledges anything or not. Because you can look with your own eyes and see. You know, look at Trump. He looked out over that massive crowd at his inauguration. If I could look out over a massive crowd, see, that's all the things I need right there. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I don't need anybody to acknowledge me. 
But I'm telling you, it's the most thankless work I've ever been involved in in my life. But I do it, and I've tried to be faithful to it. I've tried to be there every Sunday in the pulpit. I've been in this pulpit days after I got out of gallbladder surgery, and you know I'm telling the truth. I had a stinking bag hanging out of my belly collecting bile, and I had to tuck it in my pants and, and, and you know, tack it to my belt or whatever it was so I didn't make a mess while I was up here preaching. But folks, I've done everything in my power to be faithful to what God's called me to do. That's why when I pray, I can trust the Lord to meet my needs. That's why when I pray, I don't tell God what I want. I just tell the Lord what I need. And you know what? Without fail, He always comes through bigger than even I would expect. He comes through even bigger than even I would expect. Because God's will is the most important thing in our life. And if we'll pray the will of God, we'll see our, our prayers answered. If we pray our wants rather than our needs, Honey, you're going to pray for a long time. Would you stand with me today? Amen. I know that.